Greetings, we are in Senior English A, and today we will be working with Hamlet Act 1. Our modus operandi will be to listen to the entire act. Now, as you take your notes, uh, observation, as you take your annotation notes, primarily focus at level 1. That is to say, what happens? First this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Go ahead real quickly and also make a note to write down Act 1 and then Scene 1. Act 1 and then Scene 2. Skip a couple of lines in between so that when we come back tomorrow and amplify our notes, you've got some things to kind of add to those observations and preparations for the exam. Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 1. Middle of the night, on the battlements. A couple of freaked out soldiers. Hey, come to me. Stand on the boat yourself. Not with the king. Come on, John. Easy. Your comrades can't get on your armor. Just now stop when I will get you to bed, Francis. I can't just relieve much, thanks. Just beat a cup of water. I'm sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a master. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Dan! Ho! Who is there? Friends to this man. He's running the lady. Give you a good night. Farewell, honest soldier. Who has relieved you? Bernardo is my base. Give you a good night. Uh, Bernardo. Say, what is the ratio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good masters. Why does this thing appear again tonight? I don't see nothing. Horatio says it is but our fantasy. Will not let belief take hold of him, touching his plated side twice in the rust. Therefore, I have entreated along with us to watch the minutes of this night. Till again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Now it's touched, will not appear. Sit down a while and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story, what we two knights have seen. Well, sit me down, let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illumine that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus or himself, the bell then beating one. Hey, shh! Right the off. The ghost. When it comes again. In the same figure like the king that's dead. Lord of Scholar, speak to it, Horatio. Does it not like the king? Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It fellows me with fear. Wonder. It would be smooth to question it, Horatio. Where art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of many Gentiles is sometimes marched? By heaven, I charge thee, speak! It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay! Speak! Speak! I charge thee, speak! Gone. I will not answer. Oh, now, Horatio, you tremble and look pale. Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you want? <coughs> oh, my God. I might not misbelieve without the sensible and true vouch of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king, as thou art to thyself? Such was the very armor he had on when he, the ambitious Norway, coveted. So frowned he once. When in an angry power he smote the slated Kodaks on the ice. Tis strange. Asked twice before, and John of this dead hour, with martial stalk, hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work, I know not. But in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good now, sit down and tell me, he that knows, why this same strict and most observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land. And why such daily cast of brazen cannon and foreign mark for implements of war? Why such impressive shipwrights whose sore task does not divide the Sunday from the week? What might be taught that this sweaty haste doth make the night joint labourer with the day? Who is that can inform me? That can I. At least the whisper goes so. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by fought in breast of Norway, that had pricked on by a most eminent pride, dared to the combat. 
in which our valiant Hamlet, also this side of our known world distinct him, did slay this fort of brass, who by a sealed compact, well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit with his life all those his lands which he stood seized of to the conqueror, against the which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of Fortinbras had he been vanquisher, as by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed, his fell to Hamlet. <coughs> now, sir, young Fortinbras, of unimproving metal, hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there sharked up a list of landless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach it, which is no other, as it doth well appear unto our state, but to recover of us by strong hand and terms compulsative those foresaid lands so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations, the source of this I watch, and the chief head of this post-haste and rubbish in the land. I think it be no other, but even so, well may have thought that this portentous figure comes of it through our watch so like the king that was, and is the question of these wars. The motive is to trouble the mind's eye. In the most high and calmest state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell. The grave stood tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets. The stars with trains of fire and dews of blood <coughs> disasters in the sun, and the moist star, upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands, was sick almost of doomsday with eclipse. And even the light precursor fierce events, as harbingers proceeding still the fates and prologue to the omen coming on. Heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climatures and countrymen. But so, behold, lo, it comes again. Oh, I cross it, though it blast me. Stay, illusion! If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily for knowing may avoid, oh, speak. Or if thou hast afforded in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits oft walk in death, speak of it. And speak. The cock crowing will say that it's I warning. I'll with my buddies. Who will be one of those hands? Just here. Just here. Uh. Offering the show of hands, which is as the air invulnerable, and our vein blows malicious mockery. Is it about to speak or when the cock crew? And it's starting, like a dreamy thing about a fearful summons. I have heard the cock that is the trumpet of morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day, and at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit ties to his confine, and of the truth herein, this present object may propitiate. It on the crowing of the cock. Some say that ever against the season comes, wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated. Bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then they say no spirits can walk abroad. Nights are wholesome, and then no planet strike, no fairy takes, nor witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. So have I heard, and do in part believe it. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks over the dew beyond the high eastern hill. Break we our watch up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit dumb to us will speak to him. Do you consent we shall acquaint him with it, as needful in our loves, fitting our duty? Let's do it, I pray. And I this morning know where we shall find him most convenient. All right, here we go. One, two. So you got to you got to shift now in your nose. Don't worry about that fort and broad thing. We'll talk about that. Onto the stage will come all of the uh, retinue of King Claudius, his queen, Polonius, his second, Laertes, Polonius, his son, and of course, Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green. 
and the Gidas be fitted to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet, so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with the remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere, with a defeated joy, with one auspicious and one dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale, weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. Nor have we here in barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along, for all our thanks. Now follows that you know young Fortinbras, holding a week's supposal of our work, or thinking by our late dear brother's death, our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleague with the dream of his advantage, he had not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father with all bonds of law to our most valiant brother. So much for him, now for ourselves and for this time of meeting. Thus much the business is. We have here written to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who impotent and bedrid scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate hearing, in that the levies, the lists, and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, old man, for bearing of this greeting to old Norway, giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these donated articles allow. Farewell, and let your haste command your duty. In that and all things would be sure of our duty. We doubt it nothing, heartily farewell. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the day to lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? Dread, my lord, your leave and favour to return to France, from whence, though willingly, I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation. Yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France, and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. I, I do beseech you, if him leave to go. Take thy power, our Laertes, time be thine, and thy best grace is spended at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son. A little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much of the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy nighted color off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest it is common. All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Aye, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam? Nay, it is, I know not, seems. It is not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected behavior of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shows of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Tis sweet and commonable in your nature, Hamlet to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know, your father lost a father, that father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do a seat we are sorrow. But to persever in obstinate condonement is a course of impure stubbornness. Don't be aware. It's unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, understanding simple and unschooled. For what we know must be, and is as common as any of the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we, in our peevish opposition, take it to heart? Aye, 
is a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still have cried from the first course till he that died today, this must be so. We pray you throw to earth his unprevailing woe, and think of us as our father, for let the world take note. You are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart towards you. For your intending going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I prithee stay with us, though not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Aye, tis a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace well off, no junk and health that Denmark drinks today, but the great cannon to the cloud shall tell, and the king's rouse, the heaven shall brute again, re-speaking earthly thunder. Come, away! <laughs> Everlasting hath now fixed his cannon against self slaughter. O oh God, O oh God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie, aunt, O oh, fie, fie, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed, things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, and not so much, not two, so excellent a king that was to this Hyperion, to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not between the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month, let me not think on. Frailty, thy name is woman. Ouch. A little month. Or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she, oh God, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with mine uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing of her golden eyes, she married. He's married his mom. most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to insist your sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Hail to your market. I'm glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. Same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. So my good friend, I'll change that name with you. But what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus, my good lord. I'm very glad to see you. Good evening, sir. My lord. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? A true disposition, good my lord. I would not have your enemy say so. Nor should you do mine ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant. But what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray thee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon thrift, thrift, Horatio. Look at this line. General baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Ouch! Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father. Methinks I see my father. Oh, where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. 
I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man taken for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. So? Who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father? Season your admiration for a while with an attentive ear till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch in the dead waste and middle of the night been thus encountered. A figure like your father, armed at all points exactly, cap a pace, appears before them and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Twice he walked by their oppressed and fear surprised eyes within his trenchless length. Whilst they, distilled almost a jelly with the act of fear, stand dumb and speak not to him. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good, the apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? Lord, upon the platform where we were. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Yet once methought it lifted up his head and did address itself to motions like as it would speak. But even then, the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight. It is very strange. As I do live, my honoured lord, it is true. And we did think it went down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs. But this troubles me. Hold you the watch tonight? We do, my lord, we do. Um, say you. Um, my lord. From top to toe? My lord. Then saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord. He wore his beaver up. What looked he? Frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, but if I had fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. I would have been there. I would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate haste might tell. A hundred? Lord, not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was, as I have seen it in his life, a sable silver. I will watch tonight. A chance to walk again. I warrant you, will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be terrible in your silence still. Don't talk about Whatever it. Whatever else shall happen tonight, give you an understanding, but no time. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Hello. Your love, as mine to you. Farewell. My father's spirit. In arms. All is not well. A bad feeling. I doubt some foul play. What the night will come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Our deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. That's important lines. We'll talk about why later. All right, here we go. One three. We gotta have a girl. I had the fair Ophelia speaking with her brother Laertes, older brother, giving her advice. You can imagine what's going on. Embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet and the trifling of his favors, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, froward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute, no more. No more, but so? Think it no more. For nature crescent does not grow alone in thews and bulk, but as this temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide with all. Perhaps he loves you now. And now no soil nor cordial doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear. His greatness weighed, his will is not his own. For he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself. For on his choice depends the sanctity and health of this whole state. And therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then he says he loves you. It fits your wisdom so far to believe it, as he in his particular act and place may give his say indeed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes withal. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain, 
If with true creed and here you list his songs or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity, fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep within the rear of your affection out of the shot and danger of desire. The cheriest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. <laughs> Virtue itself scapes not calumnious strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. And in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blasphemies are most imminent. Be wary, then. Best safety lies in fear. Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But good my brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do. Show me the steep and thorny way to yeah, end. Don't lecture to me and then do the same thing. Between himself the primrose path of dalliant treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Oh, fear me not. I stay too long. Oh, but here my father comes. Ah. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leave. And yet here lay a tears aboard, aboard for shame. The wind sits on the shoulder of your sail, and you are stayed for. And there. My blessing with thee, and, and these few precepts in thy memory see thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. The friends thou hast, and their adoption tribe, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each unhatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear that the opposed may be worthy. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man, and they in France of the best rank and station, or most select and generous, chief in that. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season is in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you, go, your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia. And remember well what I have said to you. It is in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. What is the video he has said to you? Uh -oh. So please you, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Mary, well be thought. Just tell me he has very oft of late given time to time to you, and you yourself and your audience be most free and bumptious. If it be so, uh, uh, so it is put on me, and uh, that is a way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behoves my daughter and your honour. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Oh, you speak like a queen girl, and sifted in such precious circumstances. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby, that you obtain his tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly. Oh, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, roaming it thus, you tend to be a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in honourable fashion. Then fashion you may call it. Go to, go to. And have been in conscience of his speech, my lord, with all the vows of heaven. And that is springy, Mr. Ketch Woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue bows. These bladers, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, even in their promises it is a making, you must not take the fire. From this time be something scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command parley. The Lord Hamlet believes so much in him that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk than may be given you. If you, Ophelia, do not believe his vows, for they are brokers. Hamlet's a liar. That die which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious bonds the better to be idle. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. <laughs> Look to that, Charles. Come your ways. We shall obey, my lord. One, four, one, five, go together.
the air bite shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks a twelve. Oh, it is trap. Indeed? I heard it not. And it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to walk. They see Claudia's what party. Does it mean, my lord? Down inside the castle is party. The king that wake tonight takes his rows, keeps Wasso and the swaggering upspring reels, and as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet dust bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? I marry is. But to my mind, though I am native here under the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. This heavy headed rebel, east and west, makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. <coughs> they keep us drunkards, and with swinish phrase soil our addition. And indeed, it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pit and marrow of our attribute. So oft it chances in particular men that for some vicious mold of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose its origin, by the ore growth of some complexion, oft breaking down the pales and thoughts of reason, or by some habit that too much ore leavens the form of plausive manners, that these men, carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, being nature's livery or fortune's star, their virtues else, be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular thought. The dram of evil doth all the noble substance of a doubt to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes. Angels and ministers of grace, defend us. Be thou a spirit of hell, or goblin damned, bring with thee airs from heaven or blast from hell. Be thy intent wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I call thee Hamlet, king, father, royal dame. Oh, answer me, let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canalized bones hurst in death that broke their settlements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly and earned evoked his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again? What may this mean, that thou dead course, again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous? And we fools of nature so hurriedly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls. Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? It beckons you to go away with it, as if it's some impartment to desire to you alone. Oh, what courteous action it wafts you to a more removed ground. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak, then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Well, what should it have fear? I do not set my life at a thin's fee, and for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles o'er his base into the sea, and there assume some other horrible form, which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation without more motive into every brain that looks so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It wants me still. Go on. I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. You shall, you shall not go. My fate cries out and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called? 